Hello and welcome back to The World Around. Um, this is session two, Reimagine the World Around. Um, in this group, um, we see Earth Day um, through the lens of artists, architects, designers and filmmakers. This is a group of visionary thinkers and makers who seek ways to live together with the multiverse of ecosystems around us. They think about the plant life and non-human animals and microorganisms that share our world. We start with Malika Leiper and Kalyani Mam, um, who take us to Cambodia, where Kalyani shares with us a short film she made portraying the story of a family whose, um, the la whose land is being sold from underneath their feet. Um, we meet a studio who live with a very well-behaved parrot, Coco, that is Studio Osadiana, who are talking with um, the curator of this year's Istanbul Design Biennale, Mariana Pestana. We also meet Shanghai-based curator Eric Chen, um, who gives us a glimpse into his exhibition, uh, The State of Extremes, which was um, unfortunately uh, closed due to the extreme situation of the uh, COVID-19 crisis. Um, Eric is going to be speaking with Thomas Thwaites, um, the uh, London-based designer, um, about such things as the extremities in which we all live and work right now. And then finally, we go to Thailand, uh, where we will meet the artist and filmmaker Apichapong Virasakal, who shares with us um, a short film he made and um, reflects with his friend Andrea Lissoni on his newfound relationship with home. Um, I hope you enjoy the session and see you for part three soon. Hello and um, my name is Malika Lieber and I'm an urban strategist based in Brooklyn, New York. I'm so excited and grateful uh, and humbled to be introducing Kalyani Mam, a filmmaker, an activist and a dear friend to share her film with us, Lost World. Hi, Bon Kalyani. How are you? Hi, Malika. <laughs> Where oh are you? And how have you been coping during these difficult times? Oh, I'm so honored to be here with you right now. Thank you so much for inviting me to be part of this. Um, I'm actually in Santa Rosa, California, up in Northern California with my husband and my 81-year-old mother-in-law. And we're all doing quite well. We're, we're doing well and we're happy and we're healthy. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad to hear that. Um, so thank you for sharing your, um, uh, your film with us today. Um, your first documentary, uh, River Changes Course, follows three individuals in Cambodia whose livelihoods depend on water. And since then, you've gone on to make uh, several award-winning shorts about the changing ways of life in contemporary Cambodia and the destructive forces at play in the so-called project of development. Um, tell us about Lost World and the story you're highlighting here. Oh, I love the way that you describe all the stories. Um, because it is, I mean, that is actually what is happening in Cambodia right now is the destruction, not of the environment, but of Cambodia's homeland. And the film that we're watching now, Lost World, is about Pala, a young woman who lives in Gosar Lao, which is an island off the coast of, southwestern coast of Cambodia. And she's been living there with her family and her community for, you know, all her life and suddenly um, about over a, de a little bit over a decade ago, um, there was sand dredging that started to happen in this place. And this area is covered with mangroves, you know, mangrove forests all along the coastline, beautiful forests that are home not only to Pala and her community, but also to all the fish and the crab and the creatures that live in this place. And so suddenly 10 years ago, they started dredging this area for sand. And this sand is being shipped to Singapore to build Singapore's landmass. And so we're seeing right now the destruction of Kem Pala's home and her community's home, but also the home to all the creatures that live in the mangrove forest. Your films are so important right now because we live in this cosmopolitan world. And um, what your films do is they call into question the absurdity of development logics and what's at stake if we go on behaving under the pervasive assumption that 
urbanization is inevitable, that the only way forward is to um, build cities. <laughs> um, but underneath this theme is, is one that resonates with me, um, being Cambodian, but also I think with many other people from different cultures, and that's the theme of identity and displacement. Yes. Um, what does Lost World tell us about our relationship mm. to the environment, to each other, especially mm. in light of the coronavirus pandemic that's now connecting us all? Exactly. Well, Lost World shows us that we only have one home, and this home is the Earth. You know, this home is our planet. And we all, we not only, this home not only belongs to us, it belongs to all of us, you know, all to all the creatures, to all the inhabitants of this planet. And so if we don't take care of this home and we destroy this home and we, we remove actually the home and the land where people live on, then we have no other home to go to. You know, so this idea of home is not only, you know, Pala's home and her community's home, it's also our home too. And we have a, not just a responsibility, but a, uh, a purpose, you know, to protect this home that we have. What are you working on right now? What's next for you? Uh, well, I've been working on this project. Uh, it's called The Fire in the Bird's Nest. It's a feature length project um, about a young woman and her family living in Orang Valley in the jungles of um, Orang Valley, which is at the foot of the south of the Cardamom Mountains. And this, her name is Rain Safsi. And I've been living with her and her family for about four years now, filming her and living with her and understanding her way of life. And what I've learned from her and actually from all the families that I've lived with in Cambodia, including Pala's family, is that the land and the water is our home. And it's through their love and their nourishment of this land and, this, and their, um, the sacred way in which they honor this land, you know, this is what has, has offered them you know, this home to live in. And um, I've learned that, you know, this relationship is something that needs to be honored and protected. It's not something, you know, that we need, we can uh, take for granted. And um, yeah, so that's the, the lessons I've learned from them. And, and I've learned from making this film that I would like to you know, share with the rest of the world as well, especially today on Earth Day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, beautiful. Thank you so much, Galiani, and um, thank you for your voice um, and your activism. Please be safe. Yeah, thank Bye -bye. you, Malika. Thank you. I'll continue. <laughs> Bye. Wow, I'm going to carry a prop. Wow, I'm going to stop Rob Hatta. Flick, I'm going to sing that. 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 Đây cứ đặt mà ọt hài
เดี๋ยวก็เลยเจี๊ยดอ่ะจังยมให้นังเจียเนี่ยในสารมาจำนวนมินเจียเปียตะสิงยินในดอกบอลสมบัติยืงทางนี่คือชิกสายในดอกบอลสมบัติจังสมบัติคือเธอกาสายกองกลางจะรู้คือตระกาใดจังคือเจียตะสิงยินแต่โยงคลีซอมคลีเอาไปหลักขนาดต่อต่อต่อน้ำมุ้ยมุ้ยได้สุดบุลฉันเวียนเอาโคมาโกนเลิกกับเมียนกล้องกับเมียนให้เนี่ยหลังได้หมกเทียนแล้วก็เนี่ยเจอตามหลังหมดโอ้ยสักมุกมูชรานเนี่ยจริงตาตามเพราะเนี่ยโดยเนี่ยตั้งอ๊อกนี้เนี่ยเราหนึ่งขยมจังแต่รู้เนื้อขนมสิกได้สกชิมวยบองโปนขยมก็บันไดสลอมบงไซจับดาวมาพลายอยู่ไปตั้งอ๊อกปรีกองกลางสรองสมรองละส่วนบีมีนใบโดยตีลินบีมีนทันสนายบอดสดก้อยกลมาหายมาเตียนมาเหมือนอ่อนจันบันสมรอบปนอัดปรอดดสองลายนาไอตึงสมุนเลียนพ้นจวบไรกองกลางสายลอตรกาปรีบานปูปรุงสุวรรณมีนตุงในสารต้อยทงมุบดงในนั้นบองปนรูรนเจ้าหน้าบินตีเจ้าสายปนยิมเตอร์มาไว้ยังเราเตอร์ดัดเด็กมาหยุบอันดังมอปีขับกับดัดดังมอพันนิดแต่มุ้นใครนั่งเป็นหรือบ้องอันนี้ไอ้เยอะเอาเข้าเต้าไปอันเมียนเอาคือขนาดนั้นยิงโจ๊กดาตัวจะดาใครคุยกันยิงโจ๊กได้นั่งไงเคยเต้าเคยเต้าบ้องด่านี่คือเยอะอีอะยังดักดามมาเยอะนี่ฮะน้าแมนชนะมุ้นกระเมินนะดักบานเฉินเชียงก็เลยก่อนไปเชียงปีมอนมาโรบานเบียดเตะโรบานเนสานบานดักมองบานดักโลบานสับแบบอย่างปีกับปาลนางโบมอ๋อเขานางอ๋อมาอ๋ดามก็อ๋อเนียนไทยบีบาดแต่ทุ่งโง่นอนหนีนั่งคือสตรายได้รองตัวตัวเจ้าโกนตัวเจ้าเตะเจ้าสบายแล้วเจ้าสไลด์ดามเลยเข้ามือทำเป็นเตะหนาหนาเว้ยกำมุนวิโยตาอักไซซอซอแล้วอ่ะอ่ะมาว่าบาดไซโอวิโยติดได้เมียนเลิกเลยเปได้ปจีจนต่อดันกับปลาเปได้จ้ะทำไปจากตกยังดันเวียนนะยังวอเวียนนะวิจารยังคลังไทม์ติดก็ต้องไปจังเลยเราเล่นตึกซาตอนเล่นเคยเล่นสมบัติเราเที่ยวได้เพิ่มอะไรอ่ะมาหาเลยตึกตึกน้องเอาจากไหลน้ำเมื่อใดโบมาต่อเลยเผยกับก้าวก็ไปโบมา
Đó xoay phụ mò Đây xoay chân mẹ cái đá bên trái nè nấu tiết Xoay lắm hôn Chân phụ mặt phẩm Vì khơi dương mà tụ dương mà của bà mơ thì tâm kia kia bông chắc Thì cho tập bông mà tâm là kia mơ là vội dương yên thợ ấy kia This is Singapore's latest horticultural wonder, the cloud forest to your left, and the flower dome up ahead. Check out the mighty super trees on your left. You'll see the 22 meter high OCBC Skyway suspended from the taller super trees. You are now entering the cloud forest. This controlled climate is perfect for growing unique plants on the man-made mountain. Kê chỉ bật tệ đây miền tận, tại ai lấy khai chỉ bật tệ đây miền đây.
cái giờ đây nên mình chạy lưng khai thì chỉ phục hồi môi trong chiến thịt đạo này đây đội nó khăn dơ nữa hai bà sinh chị ở đây cứ dân kiếp đôi chia mà nụ đã mình tạ sinh nhiên ở mình chết xa hay ở mình có ba lần này trong chương chia chân ở tao bù vây xung nạ xa rộng ở chất bạc lò với bà cọt Bây giờ khơi phụ quát đang ở khả nét đau Nhưng chẳng dễ phá phụ quát ha Đây Nhi cứ chỉ đầy nhông Chỉ đầy mà bị sợ nhông Ta nhóm ạch ảnh dễ cao Vì bố nhóm ạch chê Vì xa bỏ phụ kê Hay cài vì cao còn đang thác Thơ ở mấy kê ảnh vô lập bàn Bàn trâm thật ra ở đây Mình đang thác thơ ấy cao bởi đại dương bạn chết thì tôi chỉ có mùi đến nơi tại ngày cao nó còn đã tây tập vận tải viên nơi tại sọ bom pro viên nơi tại lụt lo bằng cát pho phai bằng vi nơi tại miền ca trăng thổi nhóm bang cùng đất mây nhóm cát tha chỉ vật nhóm viên mình mình ai có mình về tận địa mình phục vạn đầu thân ạ vì ở miền đông nó dài, sang thăm thà có bữa nào chụp là hầu. So hi everyone, uh, I'm Eric Chen, independent curator based in Shanghai, uh, as well as the curatorial director for Design Miami. And I'm here uh, today with Thomas Thwaites, the uh, inimitable. Hey Thomas. <laughs> uh, Thomas is the inimitable um, London-based designer, design pro uh, provocateur, uh, perhaps um, best known for his heroic efforts uh, at doing everything from building a toaster from scratch uh, to living life as a goat as in like the animal, the, the goat. Um, <laughs> what is it? Not my greatest, <laughs> greatest ever life or whatever it is. Yeah. 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 You know, we were in Bethlehem because we were both in Tel Aviv um, because uh, you had kindly uh, participated in an exhibition that I um, worked on at the Design Museum Halom, uh, the, which opened in, in December called State of Extremes. Um, now that, that that show was sort of looking at uh, how design and designers, um, uh, what role they might play in kind of articulating and moderating um, and, and mediating uh, the sort of condition of extremes that, that one might argue that we found ourselves in and, and, and continue to find ourselves in, uh, whether we were talking about extreme weather, extreme uh, political polarization, extreme 
uh, inequality and kind of the mechanisms. We wanted to look at the mechanisms that, that drive those extremes um, and why we're kind of barreling, it seems, constantly towards ever greater extremes. And, you know, you had um, your project, Voodoo Economics, uh, in there. And, and, and I was just curious to hear from you sort of, you know, a few months later, uh, you know, what, what uh, uh, you know, if, 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 how how you might reflect back on uh, on the experience of of, of being in, in the show, which is of course closed now, though it though it'll mm. reopen at some point. Yeah, I mean, I I, I think your I don't know, you know, uh, your kind of curatorial sense, Eric, was was pretty good because you know you as in you know you kind of spoke about. Um, you know, calling it the state of extremes and like a state, you know, as you kind of wrote is not the same as uh, like an extreme moment. It's kind of a sort of a feeling of like, you know, just being in a kind of, you know, constant extreme sort of uh, situation. And so, yeah, like this kind of global pandemic is, you know, is like another sort of addition to that you know long kind of line of extreme things that seem to be happening um and so i guess for me the big question is like you know it is it does this kind of state just continue and it's this like rolling series of kind of, you know, feeling like we're in like this extreme sort of zone and, and you know, the, the extreme itself is the new normal or is there like a kind of, you know, a uh, sort of catastrophic change, you know, um, which is, you know, are we building up to something or or is this, you know, or is it, just a kind of a feeling of, you know, endless extremes kind of thing. Um, and of course, you can't really know because you can't really kind of, you know, you, you don't have like a sense of the arc of history or, you know, maybe there is an arc of history, maybe there isn't, you know. Um, and so, yeah, so I kind of, you know, as ever I'm like constantly sort of fluctuating between this like oh this is definitely building up to something versus like oh yeah well maybe everybody in the world always thinks that you know they're living in a very extreme moment and blah 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 so um yeah, yeah like maybe so well I mean we're talking about your your cycles of, of, of beard growth uh <laughs> earlier <laughs> now than uh, than in, in in december but um maybe it's sort of a cyclical thing right i mean that, that that things always sort of go go are, are pushed to extremes until they kind of uh break down and and, and something else uh happens anew or maybe this, this is a, another way of articulating the cycles of creation and destruction that that have you know gone back uh, that have been with us um mm. uh since <laughs> for, for, uh, for a very long time, or, or a way of saying, you know, or talking about the the swings of the pendulum. Yeah, it's it comes down to belief, doesn't it? If you believe, you know, if you believe in some kind of you know cyclical thing, there's that phrase, history doesn't repeat; it rhymes, which I you know, which kind of springs to my mind. Um, and so, will this? present crisis be the one that kind of yeah leads to a new normal or whatever um or a, a, a you know a new normal of crises or will it be this sort of you know okay finally the world will change um you know we can't carry on as we've been going etc etc and and uh yeah and i don't know what do you think <laughs> i mean how does it feel to you well i mean like you like you mentioned um that the exhibition state of extremes sort of feel somehow more resonant now, uh, but, mm. but of course, it's not just that show. Uh, you know, they're they're uh, talking to other curators or 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 just uh, looking back at what a lot of people were, were already working on. 
a lot of things and exhibitions and, and, and projects feel a lot more resident now. I mean, and, and, and that's not because we're all prophets or, or fortune tellers. I, I think it's more because, of course, we mm -hmm. all had a sense, or many of us had a sense uh, as observers of, of the world that something was, was going horribly awry, uh, mm -hmm. right? And um, I guess from uh, cert kind of building on, uh, building on what you were just saying, I, I guess for me, with, uh, in, th in thinking through state of extremes, you know, when uh, the sort of uh, uh, broader conclusion was that you know these processes of of generating extremes are moving towards ever uh, uh, more uh, more extreme scenarios, is kind of structurally built into uh, human cognition, uh, into uh, the ways uh, societies work, um, and that uh, they're they're so embedded that in some ways uh, you could only see uh, the, the so you you could only see them heading towards a kind of breakdown and and and, and, and only mm -hmm. by things snapping somehow um, uh, could you kind of reset and and I, I guess for I mean that that's that, that's what I find so fascinating about uh, you know speculative design you know which is a sort of field that you're you're sort of uh, uh, included in because a lot of speculative design is about starting with a question or a scenario and then kind of taking it to its logical conclusion as far as you can, Take, taking it to mm. uh, a extreme. I mean, is it fair to say that, that uh, with your work, the ultimate destination is, is failure, right? Because, because you're, you're, you know, you're a toaster, you, I mean, you really went to great lengths by, you know, you're chipping mica off of mountains, leaching copper for, for, for the wiring from, from copper mines. And of course, as you said yourself, you know, uh, in, in the end, it, it, it sort yeah, of yeah. You know, chaotic. Yeah. For goat man, I mean, you, you try to literally walk, eat, sleep, <laughs> uh, yeah. just even as a goat. But of course, that's impossible. I think my kind of constant um, <laughs> problem is, uh, you know, I keep on running into like complexity and, um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and how kind of complex, seemingly simple things are in a way like, um, and, you, you know, and it's not, fa you know, it's not, it's not like I fail on purpose. <laughs> it, it's just, it turns out, you know, it turns out what I want to do <laughs> um, is is like really kind of complex and difficult kind of thing. But, uh, you know, to me anyway, at least at the beginning, it doesn't seem like it, it should be. Um, and so, yeah, it's like, you know, maybe it's also kind of growing up a bit and kind of becoming wiser and more mature and sort of, you know, realizing what you don't know and realizing just how, you know, uh, complex reality is, you know, um, and yeah. And so that's why I think there's a, you know, even given the complexity of, reality in the you know the knowledge that you're going to fail to become a goat or whatever in terms of speculative design i think it's like really important to try and do it because that's when you kind of are forced to confront the complexity of the world and i think you know in fiction um it's quite easy to you know you can just make all the cogs fit neatly together and you know and there's none of the kind of the impossible messiness of of confronting the world uh you know and so uh yeah so in terms of failure i think it's yeah it's failure because you know either i'm just not capable <laughs> of doing what i want to do and other people might be much better at doing it um or it's failure because you know the, it's a you know the, the the world and kind of acting in the world to do anything you know to do anything is is quite uh, you know is quite complex um, and so yeah so you know 
it's easy to fail. <laughs> well, I mean, as, as they say, you know, it's, it's often more important to, to fail. Like you learn more from, from failing than, 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 than uh, in, in succeeding very often. But you're, you're failing on a kind of, uh, you're failing in a way that almost has sort of epic lessons for us as a, <laughs> for us as a species. No, I mean, like, like one, one can draw certain uh, almost like morals uh, from, from the tales that you spin. The GOAT project was about trying to lose this kind of sense of human destiny. Um, and it was about trying to kind of recognize that there is no, you know, there is no destiny for humanity, like built into the workings of the universe, you know, unless, you know, unless I get religion or something like that. Um, and so, and so in terms of like a, the creature that we are, this kind of, you know, biological creature that has been kind of, you know, brought so, you know, so low, let's say, by uh, this kind of tiny, you know, tiny, tiny, tiny nanoscopic kind of virus, um, for example, you, you know, we have to recognise that, that humans are just kind of creatures, we don't have this kind of manifest destiny amongst the stars kind of thing, even though our kind of literature seems to sort of, you know, our fiction seems to kind of feed us that kind of, uh, or, or we feed ourselves that sort of sense. And so for me, the GOAT project, the moral that kind of came out of it was like just trying to be kind of more humble and trying to recognise that there is no kind of necessary upwards trajectory. And, and you know, having read the kind of, you know, the sort of Stephen Pinker, better angels of our nature sort of, you know, read that book and and that does you, you know which is all about how humankind is you know living it's living much better than we ever have and we should all kind of stop worrying and you know let's just kind of um yeah acknowledge that that the world today is a much better place than it was before and it will keep you know going up almost you know the the curve will keep going maybe we need yeah. to let go of that and kind of understand I don't know that that there that there isn't that kind of upwards trajectory, and and so again it comes back to this kind of crises and you know and reversal and pendulums and. So there's a there's a, a non-zero but very small risk that TMS can induce a seizure. So that's the hardcore risk. So this is the TMS coil. It's on and it's set so that it'll, it'll do stimulation. If I step on this. You can hear it, it makes yeah. a clicking noise. Yeah. Basically because the magnetic field sort of comes on and off so quickly that it actually creates what are called the Rentz forces that make a physical sound. I suppose it could be, um, who's that trip trapping over my bridge? Said the <laughs> yeah. There are old uh, ways, different ritual and magic ways it's done, and spiritual ways it's done within shamanic tradition. And one thing is, in fact, that you let the outer form or the movement, that you start by imitating that, and by that yeah. you, you can better get a feel of how to become that animal. When I was small, for some reason I decided I would eat from a bush <laughs> without using my hands. <laughs> Eating directly from a tree without using your hands was profound. Taking hands out of the equation yet doing something so familiar like eating made me feel like a different creature in a way and so I was, guess I was trying to, I'm trying to recapture that feeling. The problem is without being able to know what experience of a goat or whatever is like it's not clear how you would know whether you had succeeded, right? Yeah. So you could imagine that you could start to inactivate parts of the brain and that that might sort of be a sort of fairly crude approximation. So for instance, I mean, if you could just turn off language in a person. We can't do that at the moment, but imagine you could. Not just your ability to enunciate the words, but your ability to, to perhaps manipulate those ideas in that kind of fashion anyway. And if you could turn it off and turn it back on, then you're getting there, right? Because you could, you could then ask somebody. Maybe becoming an animal is about 
relinquishing control over your own fate in a way because I suppose we're all trying to control our lives and kind of fight this battle to kind of retain control over our lives but I think it's a battle you can't win and so perhaps trying to become an animal is a it's, it's like a in a way a admission that or it's an admission that you can't control your life what this project about becoming an animal is really getting at is this desire to experience the world from something else's perspective <clears throat> because we're all completely trapped inside our own brain and our own perception of the world and so what I'm trying to do is to try and kind of get outside of myself and try and experience the world from a completely different perspective. A goat, it's living in the same physical space, but it sees these objects in a completely different way. I think the one thing we can say for sure is that things will change and we just have to hope and work towards making sure that they uh, change for the better. And uh, yeah. on that note, I think we are out of time. So uh, thank you, Thomas. It was so good Thanks, to Eric. Yeah. Thanks to everybody uh, out there. Bye, everyone. And yeah. <laughs>
different type of binders, different type of aggregates, the pigments, uh, uh, and so on. So we think it's really interesting because it allows us to work with different materials actually in different techniques. Yeah, and those, and so that's how then, because I, I know you think about architecture as also this encounter between human and non-human agents, and I guess that's a perfect example of that, right? By using an architectural material that is friendly both to, to us because it might have some certain sort of protective properties or isolation properties but then also it's friendly for another species i think that's um that's quite interesting in in, in your practice i wonder if you yeah if you, if you want to talk about maybe a project where you've applied that in a in a bigger scale i'm thinking about this because also now i know that this uh, whole COVID crisis is really limiting in many ways i mean and um in a way it's creating a certain space for you to to experiment more i think that's really interesting but it's also a space to to think a little bit about our our relation and if if there's anything that COVID is making uh visible is uh, how how we are so interdependent interconnected um and um and so i think it's really interesting now to uh, use this this opportunity as well uh or this thinking moment, the opportunity was already there and the urgency I think was there to a great extent of, of kind of designing for more than one species, right? Uh, thinking about design as a more uh, generous practice that thinks about the well-being of say like the specific client or the specific context for which you're designing, but also, uh, but beyond that, the well-being of a wider network of, uh, of, of I don't know, entities, species, habitats that are inevitably <laughs> impacted yeah by it but um yeah so i wonder if you if, if you could talk a little bit about about your work because i think this is a constant in your work that you're thinking about the, yeah the well-being of humans but also of these other other species for us there's a there's an interest in um in uh let's say in the power of spaces and objects and materials to mediate uh, relations between people but also with other uh, but also with other animals and uh, there is an interest which is however i think for us like really geared towards what it can do to us as as uh, humans so there are quite often uh, ways for us to rethink our relation with the environment and to look at other species but always through a, a perspective of let's say what we can learn which other kinds of um, beauty, which other ideas of collective uh, we can envision through that, which other ideas of public space or of a domestic space we can, we can explore. And in that, of course, in this kind of idea of uh, being, let's say, richer as people, there's also the, the, the necessity and the desire of, being, um, of expanding our own imagination and understanding towards other, towards other animals. There's a, what I think links this is a, and links maybe the material or like the bird, but projects we do is the idea that there's a, that we are more sort of, we think ourselves more as a gardeners, let's say, rather than as complete uh, makers of a setup. So we think all these objects and all these projects as part of a, say of a project of cultivation, our life with the bird, but also the way our projects work are a constant act of uh, maintenance and modification and, and care and adaptation and in turn of course uh, the other species and people uh, also adapt to this so we yeah like uh, like for example uh, like one of uh, like one of the pro projects we did uh, recently it's a part of uh, like a series uh, which we call the variations on a birdcage uh, and uh, are uh, um, one of these, uh, it's a this bench that is uh, for humans and birds, uh, and is also made with these materials that we just uh, showed you, like uh, this mixture of uh, uh, expanded clay uh, and lime and spices. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, and uh, like what, uh, like, uh, um, and basically like, yes, the idea behind it really that this bench can be like used by both and uh, could really be this kind of mediative objects uh, and uh, and uh, can be even uh, like uh, eaten or uh, transformed uh, both by the like by, by the birds uh, but also by the human. So, for example, uh, like there are also insertion of cork uh, that uh, like uh, yeah, cork will uh, go mad for it. It will start immediately eating it and destroying it. Uh, 
uh, and also these kind of little balls of expanded clay are also good for uh, for like you can eat them and also good for uh, um, uh, talk, for like absorbing of toxic materials and so on, but uh, you will, it, it would really change uh, like the bench, uh, like when it starts uh, uh, acting and playing with it. Uh. So it's it's very interesting how you describe yourselves as as gardeners, uh, perhaps more than solely architects. Um, and uh, I'm thinking about uh, your project um, Amsterdam Alleg Allegories, with with which you won uh, the Prix de Rome Prize, and um, and I think there you 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 also you know you returned this to the to the user. You said. Um, that perhaps with this project you wanted to turn the users into cartographers, into collectors, into farmers perhaps. Uh, and I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that and this fictional proposition. Yes, uh, yeah, no, absolutely. It's, uh, so Amsterdam Allegories, it's uh, like a fictional proposal for uh, a new type of public space for the north of Amsterdam. It's a sort of uh, like civic port that is inhabited by a collection uh, of floating islands, which in fact are this uh, new type of public space. And by that, uh, we really mean uh, like uh, spaces that could uh, um, enhance the actions uh, rather than consumption. So in fact, our places really to be like a climbed, uh, farmed, uh, cultivated, explored, uh, that people could explore by boat mainly. So yeah, like uh, uh, citizens uh, would be like uh, sailors and gardeners and explorers, uh, as we were mentioning. Uh, yeah, the, the idea was that uh, it was also a bit of a response for um, for the certain genericness of uh, public space, let's say, towards a certain neutrality of it. And actually, what we wanted to propose was uh, a huge diversity of rather specific ways of being in public space. So imagine, okay, the, this is in a project which was for the very center of Amsterdam, and uh, it was also marking almost a change in the geography of the city, which was moving north, which was building on the River Eye instead of rather than on the River Amstead, where the, let's say, the historical city was. So it was also the meeting of different kinds of, uh, of urbanity, some of which were not uh, so common or so accepted. It was also the, the city of the port, which is not particularly accessible. It was a, a place mm -hmm. made of uh, heaps of coal and with smells that are completely different of uh, cereals that, are, that uh, ferment and that you can really feel as you pass by or huge logistical hubs. So it was also a way to, um, to explore and discover uh, the civic dimension of these places, which are also part of the city. And uh, so these islands were proposing like rather specific forms of engagement between cultivation and farming, recycling, but also different kinds of leisure, really also simple things of lighting a fire and having a barbecue on an island or swimming in the waters of the eye. And so we were trying to speak about different ways um, in which a city could imagine its public space, but even more perhaps of different ways in which we can imagine ourselves as uh, being citizens of what yeah. we can and we can do the way we are together um, in, in public space, let's say. Yeah, and it's a. I think it. You know, it's it's a very utopian project. You 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 could call it in many ways. You know, it's an it's it's a a fictional landscape almost that you proposed. Um, but I think it's interesting how in your projects. I mean, you could almost if you cut across your projects, you could see that certain sort of propose. Uh, you know, ideals of how we could live together, how we could live across. Um, species and then in other projects you actually materialize almost fragments of this larger vision and I'm, I'm super interested in this you know in how design can do that because I think design can imagine these other worlds but also can build tiny steps towards making it and I'm thinking about um, you know in with the in the in the new institute where you did a series of more kind of um, one-to-one uh, -one experiments and there you were talking very much about this idea of a, a cross-species politics and I, yeah could you tell us about that what is what's that what's a cross-species <laughs> politics yeah yeah so that, yeah sorry this maybe requires a step back on our part the, there it was really quite explicitly about the kind of political and cultural jargon that informs the way we relate with other with other animals. So it was really about a series of words 
like uh, wild and invasive and feral and domestic, uh, which seem somewhat harmless when we relate them to other uh, to other species, but in reality they're just as charged as when we use it to speak about us people, humans and migrants and so on. So in that case, it was it was a lot about the uh, how these words at uh, territorial scale really become effective and really they mean sort of life and death and choice and they're sort of cultural choices. They're not uh, kind of scientific choices or, or by any means uh, exist out of time. They're completely tied to our ideas of the world by the way we imagine nature, by the way we project our, the relation between people towards other species. And um, so we, for this reason, we thought it was, a, was important to sort of not discuss and, and articulate them. But uh, not that the words are going to lose power, but that we should be very nuanced uh, and very articulate in the way we, we approach them. And uh, how well, this, yeah, and in relation to the fragments, mm, I think it's, exact, it's exactly as you say, like we, we look at uh, when we have a, had a chance in the end with a project like Amsterdam and Legos, because it's a, a competition that kind of explicitly asks to, uh, to propose something there and, and to collect uh, ideas and ambitions and give them, and give them an, a form. So it was an opportunity to work on something that was sort of manifesto. And it was not uh, uh, made as a fantasy. It was not made as a, as a form of escape from reality. It was made entirely as a form of uh, um, pushing, let's say, the, a bit the extent of our imagination. And also for that reason, it is possible to, for us, and that's what we try to do, to take fragments of it and make them uh, and make them real, give them agency, give them some kind of uh, power, make them things that you can touch that really uh, both represent maybe this bigger idea of how we think of uh, space, of relations and so on, but also enact it uh, even at a small scale, even at the scale of our purchase, no? Yeah, like, yeah, for example, uh, it was, uh, yeah, in, like, uh, the design of encounters uh, and in Amsterdam and Lego is like or in other projects we're doing we're designing this kind of uh, uh, um, larger scale approaches that are for migratory to rest on and uh, in a way they also come back uh, like it could be something uh, that uh, works at this uh, uh, urban scale but also something that uh, we are exploring in a domestic scale with the purchase uh, for uh, for Coco so it's something and uh, maybe this Purchases that are here behind us uh, are can be seen also at a certain scale, maybe are scaled uh, um, versions uh, of this kind of larger ones so that we imagine for public space. So, so there are always uh, this kind of interferences uh, uh, of scale, uh, like uh, in our projects, like from the models uh, to the prototypes uh, to things that are in actual, uh, uh, like uh, yeah, big scale, uh, yeah, or on a site. So well, that's fascinating. Uh, just to, to end, I, I'd just like to ask you, do you think that this, this concern with um, cr developing a design for more than one species, uh, uh, in, uh, uh, thinking about architecture as an encounter between humans and non-humans, do you think that this is a, um, a shared concern? I mean, do you recognize in other practitioners uh, in your generation a, a similar concern? And since it's Earth Day, um, perhaps we could end with your, yeah, your thinking about this. I mean, how do you, how do you see it? Do you see it as a generational concern? Um, yes, I mean, to, yeah, uh, absolutely. And I mean, we're definitely not, say, alone. To some extent, it's also, uh, it's also a bit tricky to say that it's uh, all about interspecies. I think it's definitely about proximity and about encounter, because for us, that's kind of the world we, the only world we know. We with uh, with the the urban that is almost at the scale of the planet, with a complete blurring of uh, categories that uh, seemed, uh, uh, or so we're told, seemed somewhat certain of division between. Uh, wild and domestic spaces, and now we see that uh, the wild is not what we thought it was. The domestic is completely expanded. So I, I think 
the, let's say, the encounters are inevitable and uh, to position ourselves as designers of thinking, okay, we actually design the sort of intermediary, we design the threshold, uh, we design the language um, is, is something that is shared. I think it's also not something that was completely absent from architecture as well. I think we're still completely in love with uh, uh, some projects by Cedric Price. We're still learning and fascinated by some thoughts and some design from people like Andrea Banzi. So I think there's also been some kind of um, uh, continuity, you know? And maybe what's interesting is that it always went together with sort of almost like an urban reading, like a large scale uh, understanding of things. It's probably a similar path to that of the research on materials, but we're also responding to something that we felt was becoming increasingly detached and uh, lacking to some extent uh, coming out of university. And certainly a lot of other people felt the same, no, especially, well, certainly in the kind of European context we, we grew up on, we grew up in and studied in. Oh, yeah. Yeah, great. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm afraid we'll have to, yeah, to wrap up, but thank you so much for your time. And uh, yeah, it's been great talking to you. Thanks a lot. Thank you so time. much. Uh, very soon, I'm sure. Bye-bye. <laughs> okay. Bye-bye. Good morning. Oh, good afternoon and good evening for someone. I, good afternoon to Joy Apichapon Vertakul. My name is Andrea Lissoni. I am uh, very pleased to be uh, with all of you and with Joy in particular um, on this occasion of Earth Day. Um, so we, we were asked to uh, to have a dialogue on cities, current conditions, how, how, do we, how do we live this very specific time and, how, and what does it mean to, to be distant and be connected? So I, I have the impression that the dialogue that we are about to have is actually a tradition. We, we ended up uh, having a long distance dialogue, they uh, scatter it throughout time and then meeting once a year or every second year and having a moment of beautiful silence rather than intense conversation. So, uh, so that's maybe the way we can begin with. No, oh, thank you. It's great to see you, Andre. We haven't met for many, not that long actually, no? Yeah. <laughs> But, yeah, but it's always a pleasure and I think this is a great moment to, to catch up. Yeah, we, we met in Rotterdam in uh, January, at the end of January actually, just before the film festival in Rotterdam. And, mm -hmm. and we had a large window in our back with water, whilst now I see somehow we share the same landscape. Where, where are you? I'm in Chiang Mai, uh, the north of Thailand is at, at home, oh, okay. trapped like everyone else, yeah. 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 And on my side, I, I have this beautiful green, um, somehow tropical uh, background, and it's true. I'm in London, it's, as, as you know, sometimes in London, you can have the privilege of having a backyard garden. Mm -hmm. So there is a sort of beautiful greenish jungle in my back, and there are birds, and it's silent, and gives me so much rest in this um, unresting period uh, in which indeed I am I'm, I'm locked as well and I, I can't be where I should be in, in principle. I'm supposed to be in Munich um, and particularly in this moment in an office at the Haus der Kunst, but it's definitely not, not safe for me uh, and for everyone there. This is one of the main points also, how you can become someone carrying something you're not sure about and then can be turning out being dangerous to be there. Yeah. yeah. Well, suddenly everything changed everyone's plan and everything slowed down. <laughs> and time also seemed to slow down. Yeah. yeah. Uh, when, when 
I was suggested to have a dialogue with you. I, I started thinking that um, going deeply to the personal and sometimes shamelessly the personal, actually we started our um, long-term dialogue through an exchange of letters and a project we made uh, from Italy to Thailand. And the project was a little very, let's say, intimate book that I have here with me. It's called Kujo. And it's something I always consider the, um, the DNA or, or the code um, of um, a big uh, project you made, a big uh, multi uh, screen installation you made called Primitive more than 10 years ago that was connected to the film Uncle um, Bon Me. I mention it because it begins with a letter. There are a series of letters, but I mention it for also for another reason that when thinking about your work, I happen it often to think about water and the presence of water and rivers and how mm. water is crucial, but actually on the cover of this book, there is a fire. Mm. And, and you, in the last exchange we had, not related to this conversation, you were telling me about fires. Well, it's, I'm, I'm fascinated by natural things, uh, water and fire. And especially in that project, I was working with these teenagers, group of teenagers in the village that is really dry and uh, very hot at that area. So uh, agriculture is quite tough and depends so much on weather. So, you know, there's spending time together and I was really aware about, you know, the the importance of, of fire, of water, of sunlight, and all these elements that, uh, you know, importance to their livelihood. Yeah, so I think in the work, you know, in the video works, in the photograph, you know, have this expression of, of, of these natural elements in there. And which I think for the city people may be kind of not so obvious, right? So, um, and, and since that project, I've been working, you know, in different areas, but I'm still very conscious about these elements and also the idea of illumination, the idea of um, shadows, yeah, and how it had uh, different meanings, you know, subtexts. Yeah. The, the reason why I was mentioning the fire is that when we had our last exchange, um, um, you told me that the fire in your hometown, in, in your area where you're actually now, were yeah. not uh, an art piece at all, but were haunting dramatically and dangerously uh, the, entire, the entire landscape. And you, and you shared images with me mm -hmm. of the fire uh, surrounding the skyscrapers in the town and also at night to mm -hmm. the point you couldn't almost breathe. So what, what, what was going on? What is going on? Yeah, that's beside the virus, we, we have this thing, you know, the fire to worry about, you know, because here in Chiang Mai, uh, mm. it's passing through summer and the heat here can reach uh, 40 degrees, like today too. And, and like every year, you know, there's this forest fire, uh, but this year is the most extreme in, in this region. Uh, and because of the previous fires, the government uh, forbid uh, burning of any kind until the end of April. So this resulted in, in uh, the very dry forest and with layers of leaves on top of one another uh, on the ground. So when there's a burning going on, uh, whether it's uh, by uh, accident or by nature or by legal, illegally thing, it become a catastrophe. Yeah. And, and with this unusually high temperature, the smoke is trapped you know, in, in, the, you know, in the mountain area. 
So, uh, so the house, my house is like others, is really full of smokes, and especially at night. Yeah, and when the wind blow uh, this way, you know, uh, the air quality index, you know, these numbers that we keep looking at on the website, like keep going up, and is actually beyond living. Uh, in in my bedroom, at one point, this machine tell, oh, the air is six hundred, you know, which was which was like beyond <laughs> human lung can take, you know. So, so I was wearing mask, you know, uh, I was wearing mask even in my bedroom and when I'm sleeping. Uh, and the funny thing is like normally I, I have insomnia, like I sleep only a few hours uh, per night, but these past few weeks, you know, I slept six and seven hours a night, you know, thanks to the carbon monoxide of the smoke. Yeah, but now it's, it's pretty going away and, and I'm really glad to, you know, to survive it and, and now grateful for the better air. Um, even if, you know, the machine still read like 100, 150, which is considered um, unhealthy, but it's better than five or 600, right? So, so. So that kind of, you know, create this awareness, no? When, you, when you're locked in at home, this awareness of the weather or the wind and how it affects you. Yeah, and, and normally in this season, it's supposed to, to rain. And I kind of really waiting for the rain. And, you know, when the wind come and I was really alert, you know, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's, that. Um, thank you for sharing uh, with so much uh, carefulness the, the environment you are living in. Um, for someone living in the West, this seems to me, once again, the central, let's say, statement about the current, current times, uh, this feeling of different time zones. You are now speaking about rain, and the last time I read about someone wishing rain was on the newspapers in London, uh, the guardians of the public parks last mm -hmm. week, Easter, uh, literally thinking about uh, rain dances to prevent people spreading over the parks on Sunday, which was actually a beautiful day and therefore uh, somehow working on this mental conditioning of we can still be all together outside, which is indeed uh, absolutely non-recommended and, and dangerous. On the other hand, again, from someone being in the West, the waves of information of you know, something immaterial came from the East in the last four months. And they're all about the, the earth and our living, like the fires from from Australia first and then and the virus and then what you're telling me it's quite incredible because it's not what we knew and actually never heard of and and it's really talking about the state of the world and the state of the earth we yeah. are part of it. we are <laughs> we are all have our hands in it yeah no matter yeah. it's from yeah. no Yes, yes. Well, yet, yet there is some, there is still some hope. I mean, you, uh, you, you shared uh, very beautiful images of your garden and the rain coming, as well as this uh, wonderful plum tree that uh. is becoming like fireflies at night. What, what is the history of this plum tree that is now a new presence in your life? No, now it was gone because it's the fruit. <laughs> but before, there's so so many of them because I was away from home so much that I didn't really notice this tree. And and then it, you know, it when I was when I was, I'm forced to stay home like this. Uh, become aware of all the physical things around you. And, uh, <laughs> And suddenly there's this tree, and then what is that? And then there's a lot of fruits coming out, and it just keep giving, you no? Know? And so I, it's the first time I tested my own fruit, you know, because I was always on the road, you know, for work. But 
but this is some, one thing that I'm grateful for, you know, to, to, to be aware of these precious things around. Yeah. Um, yeah Are you so keeping I, the seeds? Yes. And there's a backstory because I, I, it's really kind of mystery to me that why it had so many fruits, like keep sprouting. Mm -hmm. And for me, when I look at, you know, flowers at home or something, when, when it's really beautiful and they're blooming, mm -hmm. they're, there's a sign that they are dying. Mm -hmm. Why they want to see uh, to spread, you know, to spread the seed, you know. So when I see beautiful flowers, I always think about death, like, okay, death is coming to you. So you have to be beautiful now. So, so I, I think the same about this tree and that it keep giving that maybe it's dying maybe. Mm -hmm. So I was thinking that maybe it's communicating with me about this. Yeah. So uh, I've been eating, sending to friends and then keep all the seeds, you know, a lot of seeds, like hundreds. Oh, nice. To, okay, uh, so yeah. cool. And hopefully the friends that I send this fruit to would grow them and, you know, have, you know continue. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's very beautiful. It's very moving. And I, if I if I go back to the that little book that we made, I actually remind myself now that we had a streak of a thermosensitive of making a thermosensitive cover with the idea if that you were like if you like having warm on the cover, you will slowly see the fire burning the cover itself. And I remember this beautiful um note you always said well you you don't need to warm it up in in chiang mai because it's naturally hot <laughs> and so you have a completely different different way of seeing one <laughs> one of the sequences inside the booklet is um actually well there's a beautiful image here of kids running following a bowl of fire Yes. This is an amazing, energetic work you made, and I want to just to remind you the title, which is, I'm still breathing. Yeah, I'm still breathing. About breathing, and oh. how incredible that is, no, about what you made in the future, you will have made in the future. Beautiful memories, yeah. It feels like a long time ago. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. but there so, was already this feeling of breathing you now and having hope for constantly breathing despite any form of pressure. No? Right, right, right. Breathing in different air, <laughs> threatening or whatnot that we are sharing this. And, mm. I, and I think the last, maybe the last question is one of the last images is about the same ball appearing in a football court, in a, in a field, which mm. ends up being kicked against a screen that then burns. A screen mm. on top of which a film is projected, a film of film. This is also part of this work primitive. What are you doing now film-wise? I mean, did, what, what is happening now in, in your life? Are you, what are you working on? Uh, before this lockdown, I've been doing yes. many and have many plans. Um, I'm doing a movie, finishing a movie that mm -hmm. I shot in Colombia, and that's a feature length film about the sound hallucination. Uh, it's really personal, uh, but because it's, it's happened to me, yeah, and but it's really also exciting because it's the first project of, outside of Thailand. Yeah. Uh, and then I'm creating shorts and artworks, continuing my interest in shadows and uh, fire, you know, the source of different source of uh, lights. Yeah. And, and one performance about sleep, you know, or, or the lack of it. Yeah. And can you can you keep working in this situation, or uh, is the other barriers that prevent you from from working as you would like? I I've been trying to motivate myself, but it's quite hard because I don't know. I'm I'm not so used to this slow time. 
-hmm. and 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 also the heat too this heat is killing me and i don't like air conditioning so so uh, it's been uh, quite slow and i realized that hey i never take a break so maybe this is the time that it forced force myself to to breathe um, yeah and to to maybe to reflect of what's going on and you know i'm so lucky because i i have uh, this home and space you know but others don't you know so i've been uh, doing some donations and you know to 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 connect you know why i'm locked here mm -hmm. uh your work has been always, as we went quickly through, to me and to everyone who encountered it, so um, able to engage with future uh, events to come by triggering old feelings. And, and very recently, you shared with me a, a little film that expresses exactly what you are talking about, shadow, light, water but i will also add the feeling of being contained in a very small environment yeah. and yeah i i was curious to know what the film is and how was it made and and what is it for you yes um i really yeah happy to share this film with you uh, the audience uh, it's a film that i made when i'm happy always and is the time when I was in Bogota and suddenly with this cloudy city, there, there is the sun uh, came up uh, through the windows of my shower. Uh, and so I grabbed the camera and I just uh, shot it, uh, you know, with, with happiness, you know, just, just it's like a, a little gift from nature that I like to remember, yeah, and so yeah. So this film uh, is come out of happiness, usually whatever you know. Sometimes it's because of the depression. Sometimes because of the simple, simple sunshine through the window. That's all. Yeah. So hope you enjoy this. It's about two minutes forty seconds. Gracias.
Well, what a beautiful image to finish with and this uh, journey within words and within, uh, within rooms with um, yeah. joy, a pisha pong, cool. So thank you, thank you, thank you very much. And I hope we all are going to celebrate the earth in different um, engaged and visionary manners throughout the next eras, I would say. Thank yes. you so much. Thank you. And I hope for you too, you know, that uh, we all have our own gifts that maybe uh, if you just notice, it's really close, close by. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.